Hello and welcome to the Prepare Like a Pro podcast. If you're new to the podcast, thank you for joining us. And for those returning followers, thank you for supporting us in 2022. This is a very special episode. I've gone through the data and selected our top 10 episodes for 2022. Lots of amazing guests in this list. And I cannot wait to mash up this episode for you all. And thank you for everyone that's tuned in this year. I really appreciate the support. I'm really looking forward to 2023. Let's get straight into it. Here's our top 10 episodes for 2022. Cool joy. How important it is to stretch yourself. Like you, know, like you said, 16-year-old playing country, senior footy. Um, looking back at those moments, were they? did that really move the needle for you in terms of your development, those big step-ups? Yeah, I think so. I think um, kind of people having confidence in you and then you having confidence in yourself is a, is a big part of it. And I think football, more so than anything, is such a confidence game. You can put everything that you want, all the stepping stones in place, prepare as best as you possibly can and, and get out there and, and you lose that sense of confidence and, and your game kind of goes. So for me, that was definitely a big part of it. Um, leading into my under 18th year, I definitely made a, a clear decision. I, I remember speaking to mum and dad and said that, you know, I'm going to put everything into to getting drafted and this is what I want to do and this is what I want to spend my year 12 kind of doing. And they were 100% supportive of that and, and I can't kind of thank them enough for just kind of backing me as a young person to just go after it. And who, who were your strong influences early days to help help you during your development? Yeah, I think obviously I, I spoke about my parents, you know, they're, I think any fortunate um, kid, they're, they're the number one supporter. Obviously growing up in Gippsland and being three hours away from Melbourne where we pretty much spent two years traveling back and forth. We absolutely flogged the Monash freeway and you know, they dedicated so much time and um, and effort into supporting not just me but my brother Tom as well in in our sporting endeavors. So um, certainly, mum and dad were, were a massive influence. I think um, down at Gibson Power, uh, Peter Francis, who is the general manager there for ever, um, is an absolute legend. And and Nick Stevens, who was my coach in the under 18 year, they put a lot of confidence in me as well and, and really kind of pushed me um, to AFL clubs to, to kind of get on their radar and as well as in big country. And you know, I have a lot to thank to both of them. And How did you go about uh, approaching rehab and what were some things you learned along the way that made rehab more successful, I guess? Yeah, it was, it was a tough one. So as I said, that first year you come in, your eyes are open, you're just having a crack and then the following year, you want to make sure that you you improve on what you've just kind of laid out. And for me, I, I felt like I had a pretty good year. I played a couple of games in the seniors. I played good VFL, played a good final series. And so I was like, all right, it's my time. I want to make sure that I kind of cement my spot um, in the senior to- in the senior side. So I'm going to do everything that I can in the preseason to make sure I come back kind of raring to go. And that was pretty much what I did. I didn't go away. I, I went just back home and just trained as, as much as I could. Looking back now, what, what, is some, well, what is the most fondest memory out of all those highlights? Yeah, I definitely think that that final series that we had at Box Hill um, in 2018 was probably, I've got goosebumps thinking about it now. I, you were part of it and it was just a crazy, crazy roller coaster um, coming into that final series. You know, we finished six. We won in overtime <laughs> and then the following week we, we had a good game against Geelong and then we won by a point in the prelim and then come from behind and, and won in the granny. And that whole kind of come from behind victories that we had just was insane. And it, just, it is a bit of a blur, but it was definitely um, the, 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 the most highlight that I had in, in footy for by a long stretch. It was absolutely awesome. Yeah, a co-founder of Liminal Wellbeing. For those that don't know, what Liminal Wellbeing is. Can you give us a bit of an intro into the company you've created? Yeah, so essentially Liminal Wellbeing is a um, management platform designed for schools, youth programs, um, sporting organisations, essentially helping to support young people in seeking support, but also developing skills around their kind of mental health and wellbeing. And we look at that uh, in terms of their mental health, uh, their physical health and their social health as well. So what we've done is designed an app and a, a management platform that work part and parcel together. Um, the app's a resource for young people to 
check in, um, as I said, seek support, but, but more importantly, gain inspiration, education and skills around how to kind of create a, a preventative behaviours to support their, their mental health and wellbeing. What are some key considerations from a pre-season point of view loading in, in the AFL for you? Um, the biggest one is what's, what, what's required of your athletes in season. That's the biggest one. So, you know, you've got to sort of scale back from what they're going to be required to do for the 26 week in season period. And that could be sessional loads. So that could be, you know, what, what does the match, what does a match look like? You know, what does a mm-hmm. game look like? We've got to prepare for that. That's also, you know, uh, weekly loads. What does that look like in season? And we've got to prepare them for that or have consideration of that. And, what will a four, four or five week block look like? You know, what, what happens when we go to a congested schedule and we got a five day break or two six day turnarounds or, you know, all of those things have got to be considered because that means that's a basis for how I load, what the frequency of the training sessions is and all that kind of stuff in season. I think a mistake that I, I made in my first year when I took over the head of performance role is I sort of, I wanted to scale back a little bit on the frequency of training and go to bigger volume of sessions um, and train three, so three times a week. How do you sort of um, factor that in into your preseason loading? Yeah, well, it's just about finding out for me what the worst case scenario is from a training load point of view. So I don't really use GPS for training load mm-hmm. um, anymore. I'm just I'm going a bit old school and just looking at time and RPE and, and that kind of thing. You know, sessional RPE and time and 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 calculating that across training load. And you know, it's easy to go week to week to go like round one, round two, round three, but that's not how load manifests itself in an athlete. It's daily but because, you know, week to week could include two games or week to week could include one game or no games or whatever. So mm. sort of work on that rolling sort of seven and 21 and 28 day um, average of workload or, 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 and then have a look with your planning in season. What, what is the maximum that we're going to require to do? So is it, you know, two training sessions and two games in the space of, you know, seven days? That might be a peak. Okay, let's look at that peak. Um, then my goal in pre-season is whatever you think the peak might be in season, I'm hoping to get sort of 20 or 30% above that in pre-season. So 120, 130% of what that in-season might look like. Can you give us con- like a bit of clarity on, on why you think GPS isn't a good measure for training load? Um, so, I, yeah, I don't like it. I've come to the conclusion, like training load is impact on the body. That's the way I view training load. So what is the impact mm-hmm. on either the system or the, um, or the body, you know, is it metabolic or mechanical impact? That's how I view load and GPS inherently is like, you know, all the satellites in the sky and it's just how a player move, like where, so it's not even how a player moves, it's where a player's moved and how quick. Mm-hmm. Um, we did a PhD study when I was at the Rabbitohs with a, a, a guy there, Dan Glassbrook's his name and we got IMUs and put them on the lower extremities, put them on their training boots and looked at the actual you know, impact loads as good as we can get them without being in a lab um, with those IMU devices. And we compared that to the loads we get from GPS and they just weren't, they just weren't anywhere near, um, you know, so GPS isn't telling us what load there is happening on the body. What would be some of your go-tos to when maybe they are going through that tough training block and you know, the, you know, the, the staff need to get around them and actually build that energy because the players are going through a pretty tough block. Uh, what would be yeah. some of your go-tos to, to, manifest energy and fun be willing be willing to change your plan to do that um but there's also it's a couple of easy wins you can plan a bit of psychology here with the players you really can like we can show them we show them a training session every single day like we outlay to them in the meeting pre-training this is what we're going to get through today these are the drills this is the running this is this is what the session looks like i'm happy to add if i if i'm in a if i'm if we're in a state of Wanting the load, but wanting the players to feel like they're fresh, mm. we can manipulate that. We can add a couple of training drills to the bottom and then get to that point in time in the session and say, oh, boys, we're not going to do that training drills. Those trainings have been really good. Mm. You'll get a psychological benefit to that. Mm. Um, our players, like, we have three gym, three gym group rotations in the afternoon to keep our gym groups nice and tight. What about some common mistakes you've seen performance teams make or perhaps yourself that you've learned from that you factor in when you're planning your in-season um, performance work? Yeah, go, I'll go back to the biggest mistake, and I've made it, I've been in that, I've been as a weights coach and made this mistake, is to stop trying to improve. Mm-hmm. You know, get to the end of the pre-season and think, geez, all of our athletic development work's done here. They're strong, all, you know, we have been, our, our strength testing's gone up, our fitness has gone up. You know, let's, let's, that's, got, that's got us to the start line of the season. Let's just stop trying to improve and just maintain. 
I think that's the biggest mistake you can make because you can still make gains. And inherently, like when I'm running the preseason like I do, where my preseason has more volume than my in-season period. So the in-season actually, for a lot of the players that get through my pre-seasons, they go, well, in-season is actually easier. Yeah. Because pre-season was ridiculous. And yep. so now when the load comes off them, well, what happens then? We get a spike in performance. So, you know, it's things like speed and strength and acceleration and these physical components, they can actually get better. Personally, what has been one of your biggest challenges that you've faced and, and um, what did you learn from it? Um, I think... I, I think, in all honesty, probably the move to the UK was, was a big one with a young family and wife and the unknown um, going into a, a fairly, what is a traditionally fairly volatile sort of industry. And again, coming from outside of um, the sport, um, I think it's probably the hardest but best thing I've ever done in a professional sense. Um, yeah, a lot of sort of sink or swim moments and... Um, yeah, I think that's probably been one of the yeah, greatest, I suppose, challenges, um, but equally one of the most rewarding as well. If you're taking a player through a hamstring rehabilitation, is you know, um, is that an area that you do more research on because that's it's specific to your role in that position, or like you mentioned, how high performance culture is something you're interested in at the moment. So we read a book on that. Like, is it it's quite specific, or is it more just general in how you upskill yourself over, over your career? Yeah, um, I suppose I've never really been strategic about it, but, but, you know, probably like yourself, you know, like your offerings with social media podcasts, um, you know, Twitter even, um, that sort of thing. But probably the big thing is, is, is actually engaging with, with people. And, you know, I think I touched on it earlier that generally speaking, most people are pretty willing to, to pick up the phone or reply to an email, um, especially in AFL circles, you know, we've, we've got a great cohort as you know, of strength and conditioning coaches and, and, and physios that, you know, it's a, you're only a phone call away. And in that reporting, uh, keeping your records process, so you've got like the qualitative data, I imagine, and then what sort of quantitative stuff are you noting? Are you noting things like how the athlete is presenting from a mood point of view or is it more screening information and, and sort of your subjective view on things? What do you think is important for practitioners to know? Um, yeah. during the rehab process yeah look i think you know there's high scrutiny in afl especially so you know your objective data is pretty easy to, to come by um you know it's abundant it's um there's lots of it i probably lean more towards the sub subjective stuff you know those discussions you have with the athlete with other practitioners those sorts of things um just that mud mapping of ideas i think is really important um and yeah, that's the stuff I lean on probably more so. A couple of questions for you, Tim. Is first one would be: Is do you ever lie to a player regarding the injury to change their mentality about it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that's a that's a great question. It's a probably a loaded question. Um, I, I think some of your mess your messaging is really important. Um, well, um, I, I don't think you ever actively lie, but you might paint a slightly um, more favourable version of the truth. Um, yeah, and I, I suppose at, at the end of the day, like if your intention is good and you're genuinely doing, trying to do the best thing for the athlete, um, look, it may be you're sort of hosing down some anxieties or, um, you know, some, some, um, some fear avoidance behaviours or, you know, even just a, a player's mindset. Um, if you're trying to just nudge that, then... Yeah, I think you can craft versions of the truth, um, but I don't think you, you would ever blatantly lie lie to the athlete. He's written another question. Uh, how often do players stick to the recovery plan 100%? It may be re potentially rehab plan 100%, um, I imagine. Yeah, how often do players stick to the re rehabilitation plan? Um, yeah, it's, it's a tricky one to answer. I suppose the main thing is it's never set in stone um i think whenever you map out a, a rehab plan you always have a sort of asterisk as to your best case worst case and most realistic case scenario um and as i touched on earlier there's no such thing as as a perfect rehab by any stretch but equal to that you can have rehabs that you know exceed your expectations and and that's where you sort of need to lean on 
your sort of clinical experience and the experience of the, you know, the, the high performance practitioners around you to, you know, to bounce ideas. And it's like, you know, can we, can we push this? Um, so it, probably in terms of putting a number to it, you'd hope that you get most of them around the ballpark, but, but obviously, if you, did, you know, things happen and, you know, guys progress or they even regress at, at, at certain points. Uh, in your work life, what are your pet peeves? What makes you uh, angry? There's a couple of things. I think the first thing is, um, you know, I'm not saying this because I, you know, it's an issue at, at any point, but one of the things I, I struggle with is, is people who aren't willing to engage with each other in that sort of high-performance medical space. Um, you know, they're not willing to embrace the transparency aspect of the, the business. Um, so that's something that kind of annoys me. I, I, I really I don't like turf wars. I don't like, you know, these sort of people working in silos. That, that frustrates me at a, at a professional level. Um, and then communication, I think, is, is pretty, again, it's so cliche, but it, it's pretty important. And, and people who don't or refuse to communicate um, sort of drive me a bit mad at, at various points. Tips for, for new dietitians working in high-performance environment? Yeah, look, I think it's, um, it's, it's, such, a, it's such a big question. Um, and you can see, you know, tonight there's five dietitians on here who have talked really broadly, all of these from different points of view. You know, we've, we've heard about game day and that pointy, pointy end of performance and fueling and what that looks from a, a physical and, and cognitive perspective. Um, we've heard about injury recovery and, and injury prevention and return to play um, and also immune function. We've heard about body composition and, you know, the chat too around what what should we be looking for and you know even even your question response to about jack about um building muscle mass and what's appropriate or, or not appropriate across the length of an, of an athlete's development life and what stages they're at what positions they're playing um and we've heard too from simone you know on this um cooking skills and shopping and nutrition education so I think, and, and even all of those topics, as broad as they are, are only just starting to scratch the surface of what dietitians actually do. Um, you know, we've got, um, you, you're talking about sleep, um, gut health, the more clinical side as well of dietetics. Um, and I think that that starts to give a really clear indication of of one, all of those areas, but two, the broad understanding that you need to have. So I think if you're a dietitian looking to get into sports, it's understanding not just not just your knowledge, but how you fit into the bigger picture as well. You know, you've got to be able to engage with your S and C staff. In your experience, what what are what are some effective ways that you can yeah be effective with your time? I guess. Yeah, I think again, I think it's you know we come there's probably this old school view that dietitians are, are either the food police um, or we look after body comp and skinnies. Um, and as even, you know, Ben spoke about when he was speaking about skinnies, that if, if that is the component that you're chasing, thinking this is the way I'm going to get better, then you really are missing the bigger picture because it's, it's so much more um, holistic approach than that. Um, so I think if you know if you're if you're a coach or if you're a, another high performance support staff in that in that environment, if you're not asking your dietitian, you know how can I get this athlete to sleep better? Or this athlete's coming injured all the time, um, or this athlete seems to get sick all the time. If you're not including your dietitian in those conversations as well, you're really getting you know just a really finite amount of the expertise that you could be getting from, from your dietitian. From the dietitian's perspective, if they are getting a bit of a roadblock due to the leader in that environment, have you been able to influence that situation and, and turn it around or is it a matter of wait for a new boss? <laughs> it can be a little bit of both. It, it's, it's certainly challenging. And to be fair too, you know, I understand that teams have, have budgets as well. Um, and I guess, you know, if you, if you are a team operating under a budget and you're a dietitian coming in with limited hours as well, it's finding where, where's your bang for buck. And that mm. has to be the health of an athlete as a priority. So, you know, dealing with dealing with an athlete's health first, and that might mean that you're missing out on all the performance, actual performance, um, but you're at least starting to get this, this education based and, and have these touch points of, of health 
to build it from there. What about some common mistakes uh, either that you, um, you've learnt from early days um, and how did you correct them or pra- you've, you've, you've heard mentoring other practitioners and, um, yeah, common mistakes for, for, I guess, those cutting their teeth? Yeah, look, I, I mean, every, everyone's still learning all the time. I've learnt things tonight from listening to the other dietitians here as well. So I think that that's, that's always important is to never feel as though you either have all the answers or you have to have all the answers. There's nothing wrong with saying, uh, you know what, I, I don't actually know that, um, but I can go and find that out or I know who to talk to about that. That's that's always the best approach. And, you know, athletes, are um, they're pretty good at seeing through you as well. So if you don't know, you don't know. Um, don't don't tell them that you do and bluff your way through. At what age did you discover you had a passion for strength and conditioning? Yeah, look, that's a while, while ago now, isn't it? I, I think if I was to look back on, on sort of where it all started, um, I was back in 1994, which is a long time ago, I was a member of the Victorian Institute, Institute of Sport Cricket Squad and, you know, I was still sort of aspiring to wear the baggy green myself. And as part of that scholarship program, I'd, it was my last year of high school. I'd, I'd have to travel in three times a week into RMIT where I'd do my weights program. And it was my first exposure to what is classically known as strength conditioning. And a guy named Vern McMillan was the strength conditioning coach for the Victorian Institute of Sport then. And I'd go in there as a sort of 17 year old and I'd be training at, you know, 6 30 in the morning. And members of the awesome foursome would be, you know, power cleaning weights and, you know, other really elite athletes would be walking around the, RM, the old RMIT gym in the city. And I was amazed and blown away by what people could do. Uh, early on in your career, like as you mentioned, um, uh, Vern McMillan, well, who were some other strong influences that uh, helped you along your way? Yeah, the, fir- the first person who gave me, a, gave me a shot was David Butterfin. You know, I, I was in my you know, final year of my undergrad degree and David Butterfin was at the North Melbourne Football Club at the time and, and through some personal connections through, through my cricket, and, you know, he gave me a bit of a shot and it was a volunteer it was doing all of the sort of bits and pieces work at the North Melbourne Footy Club, trying to essentially help David's job um, to be a little bit easier. You know, the resources at an AFL club in the late 90s were not the same as they are now. Um, so I was really lucky to, A, get, a, get an opportunity and, B, because there wasn't, you know, every man and his dog there, I was able to, you know, get a feel for all parts of the program. You've had a lot of leadership positions across different sports. Is that something that you've worked on a lot, the leadership? Uh, communication, um, you know, performance meetings, all the things that come with being in a managerial position, or is it something that you've learned through experience um, and being, you know, by getting those jobs? It's both. So, you know, like, uh, fortunately, when you're, when you're sort of in positions of, of leadership, you get exposed to opportunities to develop more of those skills and you get opportunities to sort of identify where you, where some of your shortcomings or opportunities, so your performance opportunities might lie. Um, but certainly, I mean, it's and certainly more recently, you know, that, that's an area that's of great interest to me is how I can actually be a more effective leader. How can, how can I be a more effective communicator, making sure that, you know, constantly seeking feedback from people on what's working, what's not working. Those are, those are things that are, that are hugely valuable to me. If you're getting, uh, let's say, 10 different things, there's a couple that, that line up, but 10 different things, um, how do you manage it? How do you filter that to action? Those areas. Uh, yeah, so so I've, I've talked about this. One one of the so one of the things is that um, as trying to trying to um, identify and prioritize those responses that are, are generally relatively consistent. You know, you'll, you'll always get ten things, right? and there'll be ten different things. But in amongst the ten, you'll find that there's one to three things that are re- that generally are, consi- are a consistent theme. So I'll prioritize those, uh, but they also need to be they also need to be sort of understood in in conjunction with your own sort of personal an, an analysis and insights. So understanding how do I how how do I think I'm going? Where am I being effective? What's not what's not working? Okay, is there is there some common ground with the responses I'm getting from the people around me? And those are the things that I tend to attack first. Favorite inspirational quote or life motto. The thing I always find about, about quotes is they're very, very context specific. 
So I, I think that, you know, different quotes will resonate at different times in your life. But one of the, one of the things that I've, I've probably stuck with me is, is, is that, you know, no plan, and apologies for the sort of war reference, I certainly don't want to glorify the sort of military environment at, at the current time, but certainly the quote, no plan survives first contact with the enemy, I think holds, holds a lot of resonance for me in what we do. Um, we have to plan. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, you know, religious planner. I like to be well planned. I like to be well prepared. But it just reminds me that actually, it's really important to be adaptable once, once you hit the trenches, because the reality is that the plan never goes to plan. And in terms of mentors and influences, um, when you started going from the athlete to a, to a practitioner mode, who were some strong influences? So there were, there were some coaches uh, in France who were uh, video analyzing the athletes. And so yep. they are not internationally renowned, but they are really, really uh, well known in France for that, you know, frame by frame, very detailed analysis of the running technique. And um, on the biomechanics side, I was really influenced by my uh, PhD supervisor, um, who was a doctor, medical doctor, Professor Di Prompero in Italy because yeah. he was trying to analyze the locomotion and the uh, energetic cost or the biomechanics with a very, very big picture first approach. Like uh, what does a human body need to produce, to run fast? You know, very mm. rough, basic, uh, Newtonian laws of motion approach. What would be some practical tips that you found on improving a athlete's um, max velocity? So the max, well, I think max velocity is influenced by two, two factors. First is the ability to generate that max velocity. So to go there, it's not, max velocity is not something that happens, you know, uh, alone. It's acceleration to max velocity. And so if you are able to accelerate more and your body is able to produce more uh, speed, you will be faster. That's first. For example, when you pull someone, uh, almost everybody is able to run faster. When you, when you help me produce this, this extra force in acceleration, eventually I will run faster. And then from the, for the coach's point of view, and giving feedback to athletes, um, do you like to focus on internal cues, external cues? How many cues do you like to give an athlete? It, I know it's a very general question, but when it comes to, to speed and power training. Yeah, so you have to be very careful with uh, how the athlete reacts to internal or, or external cues. Uh, I, I can recommend the works of Nick Winkelmann on that. That's really, you know, an amazing uh, um, book and, and coaching reference. And uh, the idea is to, in my opinion, the idea is to use uh, high-speed cameras and, and, and today's iPhones and iPads slow motion because most of the athletes, by definition, when they, they don't run, let's say, correctly, even if that's a, that's a two-day discussion, what is correct, um, yeah. they don't realize exactly the way they run. For example, if you have an athlete with a very forward inclined trunk when they run mm -hmm. and you ask them, do you think your trunk is you know, upright or forward or backward oriented? Most of them don't have the ability to correctly uh, describe what they did. In terms of drills to, to help strengthen that hip extension, um, you've got like your A marches and A skips and, and like maybe figure four switches on the wall. Are they some helpful things to do to practice that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Blend, um, you know, and... knee dribbling, uh, very, very intense knee dribbling, uh, extending limbs, uh, uh, skips and so on. But again, mm -hmm. you can take the very same drill and depending on the instructions, have a totally different stimulus. Take the A skip, that's the, you know, it's the A skip because it's one of the most common. You can have an, an A skip drill that is done with a very powerful hip flexion, but a hip extension that is, you know, like, you know, loose. Yeah. Yeah. Or you can have exactly the opposite. The rhythm is totally opposite. You can have a very loose hip flexion and then a super powerful hip extension. That's the exact same drill. How do you keep yourself at the top of your game? What are some of your favorite ways to upskill your knowledge? Well, I think social media, well, well, well used social media is, uh, is really interesting. Uh, when you mix um, Twitter and Instagram to see who is doing what and following, you know, uh, uh, good coaches and good professionals, I think it's a good way. Yeah. Uh, yes. But definitely the, the other way is to read. Uh, I mean, you, 
you have to read papers and you have to be aware of, if you hit the keywords, uh, sprint, soccer, rugby, hamstring uh, on PubMed and you receive the alerts on that, you get something like a hundred papers a week. So of course, not all of them are interesting, but at least every week there's one or two papers out that you need to, to see and read to, to update knowledge. And the second thing is that I try to keep my hands on the motor. So practicing myself, uh, new exercises, new ideas. I'm, I'm very often at the gym trying some stuff. For yeah. those that um, do want to become sports psychologists, take us through the steps and um, what you need to do to be a qualified sports psychologist. Yeah, so um, if you want to do psychology, basically the first few years undergrad, um, you can do it through a sports science degree, a science degree, just go straight into arts psychology. So the undergrad yep. is pretty similar no matter where you go. Um, I found that doing the human movement sports science degree and then with the psych just gave me a really good ability to be able to um, talk to the dietitians and the doctors and the physios and have a really good understanding. Yeah. Um, so that was my logic for wanting to do it that way. Yeah. Um, once you've done your three years, you then can do a graduate diploma, so fourth year, mm -hmm. or you can do an honours as your fourth year. And then once you've finished your fourth year, you have to go and do a fifth and sixth year. So that'll be um, a master's or you can pick a PhD. And after that, you're a general psychologist. Mm -hmm. And then once you're a general psychologist after six years, you then go and do you know, anywhere from 18 months to two years working as um, a sports psych where you've got a supervisor. How competitive is it to get your foot in the door and what would be some tips that you would give for, I guess, um, for those people that want to work in high performance? Yeah, look, I think it's getting really competitive now and, and the courses, you know, there's not a heap of courses around, but if you, I, I would say, as soon as you know this is what you want to do, start reading. Um, there's so many books, there's so many resources, there's so many podcasts um, and things like that. So you'll hear, you know, some of the best that are, are around doing these sort of things um, to learn from. Yep. I think the biggest, for me, my biggest asset has always been networking. Mm -hmm. um, every opportunity I got, I was prepared to take it. I would drive two hours to be able to get an opportunity with, you know, a netball team or, you know, I drive an hour and a half this way to, to be able to go and work with a swimming club. So I think um, embracing any opportunities that you actually get. And the other side of it would be, apart from reading and, and listening to podcasts and things, is um, making sure that if there's conferences on and things like that where you can see there's a sports psych stream and there's some sports psychs that are well-known or, or in certain organisations that you want to be in. How did you go about building the rapport with athletes and building those soft skills? Yeah, I think that's, you know, a big component is is for me. I think I've always said, you know, you've got to make sure that, that you listen and, and just try and keep your head and your bum in, in the same place and not try and think too far ahead and go, right, I'm just going to embrace this opportunity. And, and every every athlete has a story. And, and for me, I find them that interesting that it doesn't matter if it's an under-16 state player or mm. it's, a you know, an Olympian or an AFL player i think it's actually just about listening and giving them your time and working with them not the textbook gives you a really good baseline of understanding of you know areas but i, I think the athlete is the one that gives you the best guidance on what you need to do with them and what they want and then it's a really collaborative relationship when you're feeling a bit overwhelmed and you're frustrated with yourself because you've made a mistake or you've let down a teammate whatever it might be um what, what what should you do? Because if you hear about mindfulness, breathing exercises, is it speaking to yeah. a mate? What would be, or is it depending on the individual? Yeah, look, the first thing I would always say to an athlete is ask yourself, what can I control? Because mm -hmm. human beings by nature, we're control freaks. We don't yeah. like not being in control because then we don't feel safe and we don't feel like we're going to get where we want to go. So ask, having a really good dialogue of, well, what can I control right now? You know what? I can just work on my footwork. Um, I'm just going to focus on, you know, um, getting good percentage tennis for the next two points and just get myself feeling pretty good. Um, mm. I'm just going to go to the back of the court and take a few breaths, you know. Um, so those sort of things, let's say if, if it's a, a tennis match, if it's a football match, when, when you come to the bench, um, it might be talking to somebody, it might be doing some breathing, it might be going for a walk. 
Um, it might just be getting um, a footy in your hand and just doing a few ground balls and just getting a bit of touch. For, for a footballer's week and you're in season, um, yep. what are some things that you do with the players earlier in the week and then and then what and that's recovering and I guess um, absorbing the game, whether it was a loss or a win or whatever it was, and then yep. um, to help reset for the preparation for the next week. And then also, what does it look like the day before a game? Is that something that you work with the individuals to create like a, a minus one day prep? Yeah, so I think it's um, it's very much individual. Like you'll have different uh, routines, different assessments, different ways of doing it with different athletes because they're all playing different positions and they've got different personalities. So, um, you know, you might obviously as a... Um, as a team, you, you sit down and they'll do their review and it might be asking questions to the entire group. Well, you know, my big thing is, is in so many teams I've seen reviews done where it's we did this and we didn't do this and we didn't do this. And I'm, my question is, okay, great. That's a verbal replay of what happened. I saw that, watched mm -hmm. that. Um, mm -hmm. Why not? Why not? Like you've got to ask that why question. Why didn't we follow our structure here? Why did we panic in this situation? Um, you know, why why didn't you get the reaction time that you want or why didn't you remember our plays or, or whatever? And often they, they may not be able to answer that why question, but you've got to keep trying to find it and keep asking it. Session you had with Loris, how did that come about? Was there a connection before you guys met? Like obviously you saw something in you, so was there... Um, what yeah, no, conversation I, come about? really, really honestly, by chance, um, my, my dad was living in Brisbane at the time um, and I went up there to visit him and he took me to a, a Lions Geelong game and um, I don't know how it, it ended up, but yeah, we, we ended up down in the Geelong rooms for some reason. I think he had a business partner or there was some reason I was down there and I saw Loris stretching the guys and handing out drinks and all sorts of stuff and I was sort of standing near him and I just started talking to him and he, he's a lovely bloke, Loris. I'm not sure if you um, know much about him. And um, he was no, really, he's, really he's been, open. He's been, and... he's been on the podcast. He was a ripper. Oh, he's been and on the he, podcast. He, yeah, no, nah, he's, yeah, yeah. And he and he, he was just, yeah, he was just the loveliest bloke. Um, and, yeah, I'm not really sure why he, why he, uh, <laughs> why he gave me so much. But, yeah, thank God he did. But how important is it to really own that assistance? Yeah, I, yeah, I think um, I think it's really important that if you are lucky enough to get a role, an internship, um, you know, it's really important to do the little things and take the initiative and not have to be asked, I suppose. And just, I don't know, it, 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 it it's, yeah, it kind of, you don't want to um, belittle people by telling them to put cones out or, you know, you just don't want to see some enthusiasm from them. Um mm. And, and then I think in turn, when you see that and you see that someone's really into it and really excited to be in your environment and learn, um, you're probably more willing to give them more of your time um, to pass on what you, you know and, and kind of help them. And, and going back to your career, like you mentioned Loris, who are some other people that have helped influence your um, career? Yeah, I'm, I'm really lucky. I've, I've worked with a lot of, um, I guess you call them high performance managers now or senior fitness guys. So Loris was my first. Um, with him was Chris Dennis, who taught me a lot about strength training. Loris taught me a lot about power. Actually, Loris taught me a lot. Um, he was a great mentor and um, someone to bounce and learn a lot off. Um, after after the Cats, I was lucky enough to get a job. Um, so have you, you, do you know Cam Falloon, who is yep. quite a successful business guy? With He's been on body as well. Fit. Oh, has, yeah. been on <laughs> so Cam, um, Cam and I were at the Cats with Loris in 2006 um, and um, that all ended and, and Cam got hired as, as head of fitness or whatever the role was called back then at, um, at the Western Bulldogs. And How have you found you've changed your philosophy, both S&Cs yeah. but also for athletes listening, for footballers that, want to, that don't have access to an S&C? How should a footballer yeah. be preparing for the game, do you think? My philosophy is I've changed from trying to get the guys as strong and powerful and whatever as possible to how's my program um, get these guys into great shape for AFL, but also keep them injury free. Um, so yeah, it's moved. It's moved to more of a. I suppose we we do a we do kind of a conjugate program where we we still do touch on strength in the first part of a week, um, but yeah, we definitely do a lot more dynamic work than what what I would have done 10, 15 years ago. What about our favourite inspirational quote or life motto? 
aim for the moon, and if you miss, you'll hit a star. Kind of think big, you know. And if yep. if you miss, you're still going to do a pretty good job. Um, Dima Dima's got a philosophy of eight, the eighty twenty rule. If you're doing things, if you're doing eighty percent of things well, you're generally doing a pretty good job. And I think you know perfection doesn't necessarily exist. So you know, kind of, and that's anything I'm doing as a parent, as a father, or in my professional life, or as a husband. I kind of think if I'm doing things pretty well to that extent you know I'm, I'm not too harsh on myself like i used to be with things I hope that makes yep. sense yeah 100 percent. that's a good one you mentioned Stu and russell what about some other strong influences in your career early days yeah it was so probably two two of the lecturing staff stood out so paul ford being one who had um different ideas on training to, to what i'd been exposed to uh, up until that stage so he he was he was quite challenging in a lot of ways I probably still is actually um, probably still challenges a few but it was it was for me it was really really good to get a different perspective on on training and really functional type training that can be done um and then i, I had a, an exercise physiology lecturer uh, mark fabreo who um, for those that know Professor Mark Fabreo, um, you'll know him as a, as a brilliant medical researcher these days, but he was, back then he was probably still dabbling in some triathlon. He'd been uh, quite a successful age group triathlete um, in, his, in his time. Uh, and so lots of conversations with him around training. And, and back then he was dead certain that he knew everything about training. I'm sure he's softened over the years as we all have. What did you draw on those guys to, to increase your productivity? What was some sort of standout? Well, Maddie was well after I'd finished mine, <laughs> so that's. Um, I I think it's just seeing the work ethic uh, and seeing seeing them challenge themselves um, in ways that that aren't quite normal. Like Stu dropping weight for to fight in a lower weight division, whilst you know still actually being active and and his brain working properly and uh, being able to do his day job. Just just how they actually just day to day do that and and manage that. Um, so Maddie was was inspirational in the, uh, and I, I don't think he'd mind me saying that he, he's not necessarily a, a natural student. You know, he's he's very very much in the applied camp, mm -hmm. but he engaged with the PhD process and just worked his butt off with it. Um, he really really put the effort in, and if you're organised and you put the effort in as a PhD student, you're you're two thirds of the way there really. How's the project going now to you? Five years in, is that right? Yeah, so we're we're the test institute for FIFA around the uh, the accuracy of athlete tracking systems. So that's the, yep. the main project that we're involved with. Uh, we're also doing some testing around virtual offside line um, that FIFA want to use in the World Cup this year. And I think we're as of today about thirty seven days away from our next test event where we actually test the accuracy of that as well. So that's optical based systems that can do limb tracking. Um, because obviously there's scoring parts of the body in football or, or soccer, as, as we know it, probably more so in Australia. Yep. And so any scoring part of the body, you need to know the position of that relative to the second last defender and when the ball was kicked uh, to determine offside. Uh, and at the moment, wow. if you need to go to the, the video referee, the process takes too long. So they want a, an almost real-time solution, uh, which some of the optical pro providers may well be able to, to do for FIFA uh, with enough accuracy that it's actually worthwhile. So that's that's the next challenge really for us. And uh, the, the relationships that Victoria University has with these uh, high-performance sporting clubs like Western Bulldogs, uh, why do you think other clubs don't have that relationship? Clearly it's been successful for Western Bulldogs for, with their premiership success once the program had started and, and speak to students that have done the cadetship, they get a lot from it. So mm. it seems like everyone's winning um, with that partnership. Yeah, I think I think most universities or most teams have some sort of a partnership with the university, probably not to the depth and breadth of the Bulldogs VU one. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that, that most clubs have access to something from whether it's one or multiple universities. Um, I think partly... Well, well, Professor Mike McKenna, who was my PhD supervisor that I mentioned earlier, he was actually a former Bulldogs player as well. So there was a passion there on, on the VU side really driving it at our end, which then drives it up through the hierarchy of the university and, and ultimately having the Vice-Chancellor as someone who recognised our strength in sport, but also the potential of a local partnership uh, that could really cement that Footscray region. Favourite inspirational quote or <laughs> life motto? 
I'm not sure if it's inspirational or not, but one I, I used to, to say to my cyclists when I was coaching a, a few times was just remember it, if it didn't nearly kill you, it, sorry, if it didn't kill you, it probably nearly did. Um, and, and that you know, it's a lighthearted way of, of saying that that was a really hard session that you just did. So it's a reinforcement of work, work ethic by them. Yeah. Um, it's, it's partly building belief as well. So it's, you know what, you've actually just done something that was really, really hard. So if you can do that in training, two things. One, your opposition may not have been doing that today. So you're, you're ahead of the game by, by doing that session. And remember, in races, when you think it's hard, remember back to today. And nothing in races is going to be that hard ever again. Mm. Uh, this is the hardest training or event stuff you've ever done. So it didn't kill you. It probably nearly did, but it didn't kill you. And yeah. you, you got there by working hard. And I think... You know, there's who knows how many talented athletes out there. There's there's truckloads of them in every sport. I guess start with the physical side. What what would be some common um, drills that you would do with young developing footballers to improve their their strength in the gym and, and then their skill acquisition and then maybe go into the mental side as well? How can you boost your confidence going into a game maybe if you are a forward? Yeah, all right. Let's, we'll, we'll talk about the physical side of things. Just a good, good basic um, strength training program. Uh, is a yep. really important one. Um, you know, for the sort of 14, 15, 16 year old athletes, they're starting to develop and get stronger. Uh, even all the way through, I would say that S and C is essential all the way through. Um, mm-hmm. But it's a really good basic program. It's specific to kicking. The ball's in contact with the boot for uh, 10 milliseconds, um, and it's it's you know you can get a thousand newtons or 100 kilograms worth of force. You know, if you're kicking it long, so there's nothing that can quite mimic the impact in the gym. So you need need the kicking part for that, but just that good base core strength is a core strength is probably the one that's I think it's changed the most in my time yep. um, as a as a crucial one um, and glute function probably they're the two biggies. In your experience, being in the S and C room, being in the trenches, and, and specifically running a kicking program and an AFL program, what what would you say is a healthy amount of volume of kicks for for? A, mm any player once they've got the technique down pat and you know they're they're moving efficiently and they they've got a good read of their body and all those type of things but can you handle a fair amount of volume do you think over yeah if you can um they can handle more than they do probably i think i would also, also say a few things on this i could probably do a whole podcast on that it's, yeah. it's, been, a it's big, been a big topic um yeah just a few snippets from across the board i, I remember talking to eddie jones the now english rugby union um guy and he was a uh, coach and he at that stage, he was with, his, with the Australian team and Chris Connolly, who was our, our head coach, had a strong relationship with him. So he came around and spent a, a week with us. Um, and I talked to him about kicking and, and all the things that that I do and um, which he's really interested in. And I talked about volumes. I said, oh, that's one of the challenges. He, he said, well, it was a funny one. He said, look, if, well, if these were my guys, I'd be just saying to the S&C guys, just go and get them fit enough so that I can do as much kicking as I want. It was quite funny. He was pretty combative about it who are some strong influences or mentors if you like um that you had to, yeah. dad with dad around hockey and cricket in tamworth where i come from originally new south wales yeah. um and they were just ahead of their time with with um you know with training it was all lots of um games for learning and, and small-sided games and numbers and um stuff that at that stage wasn't done it's done a lot more now but it wasn't at that stage done so you know it's more like lines and and um and more sort of isolated stuff. So they, he uh, and he was just a really good coach, and it gave me a passion for coaching. And and um, probably the the other thing he really instilled in me was watching off the ball. So n- never watch it. He never used to watch on the ball uh, a game, whether whatever it was. Like he'd come down. I'd come down when I was working at Freo. I'd get into games, and he'd be he'd never be watching the ball. He'd always be watching to see what was happening up the ground or down the ground to see what why you know why is why is the full forward in ten meters of space now. What would be some things that you do, like like you mentioned, the importance of building technique, but then building confidence with your technique, um, bringing those two together. So, let's say you get a player to a point where their technique is now efficient, um, to a point where you feel like that it's in a good spot. Now we want to build confidence in it. Um, what would be some things that you do for for players in that position that's effective? I think um, I think making sure that they. They understand that they've improved and showing their improvement. So we, I mean, we've got a lot of stats in 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 AFL, and that can that can certainly help. You could got a lot of stats in in lots of grades of footy, and that can that can help with your efficiency. Um, 
you can get, um, I mean, feedback from other people that can often um, be good, but don't expect it um, because a lot of times I did, a lot of the guys I've worked with uh, at the AFL level, there's sort of three levels of your kicking really. You've got the, the guys who are really good kicks who people talk about all the time. And you've got the guys who are really bad kicks and they, they, they talk about it all the time. But then there's this yeah. big middle group. You just don't talk about kicking. And that's a yeah. good thing. So I talk about the guys who have moved from the, you know, that they're a bad kick to into this. Well, nobody's talking about it. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. That's a good thing. That's, that's a good positive. And what about the, the best kickers that you've worked with? What, what have you learned from them, the ones that do it really well, well in games? What are some of the big, big rocks? Well, some of the really good technical ones. So Nathan Chapman was fantastic. He's now doing the, um, he pro, he's pro kicker. With the, yep. So he was probably the first one I saw. I remember Jade Rawlings telling me he's the best kick in the club. Um, and so I looked at him, I looked at his technique um, a lot. So and one of the things, one of the a big group of, of kickers is that they've got really good range of motion in their knee and their hip. They're the guys who kick long. Um, so Greg Inglis was really good at that in rugby league. Uh, Matthew Pavlich was really good at, at Frio. David Mundy was probably, David Mundy's probably had um, the best technique I've seen out of anybody I've worked with. 